Welcome to the Northern Ontario Mining Showcase podcast. It's a limited series for the Echo Community Podcast Network by Story Studio Network and Clark Communications. We highlight the influential voices, partners, and leaders who are driving innovation, research, and development, creating new market opportunities and new ways of doing business in the mining industry. Here we are at uh, PDAC 2024. And a lot of the conversations going on around here is about how we're extracting minerals and the, all the new science and the technology and everything. And I want to get into what you guys do at, uh, at, at Whipware. But um, I think um, a lot of the stuff, uh, Andrew, that we sort of take for granted is right in front of us. We're both sitting here in front of our phones. Yes, yeah. <laughs> and, and the idea that what's that got to do with mining? But, it, you know, this whole idea that... Um, so much of what's driven in that in that you know handheld device that now drives our world happens in this room. Yeah. Right. We rely heavily on everything that's being extracted in yep. so many of these mines around the world. So that for people who think that the mining sector is something that happens over there, I've got news for you. You're carrying it around in your pocket every day. It's it's a technology industry for sure. It's and more so it's moving fast, fast, fast in that direction. They're one of the <laughs> it's funny. When I started with Whipware, which was only five years ago, uh, it, we were the big conversation was the struggle to push minds to adopt technology and to trust it more and that kind of thing. The flip side now, it's that's not a push anymore. They're asking, they're calling for it. It's, Can't get it, enough it's of a it. very short amount of time for that cultural shift to kind of happen. Um, and I think what's cool too is that you also have so many people entering the market now, or entering sorry, the industry now, is work, the workforce is changing so much. There's a lot of young people flooding in who are so used to technology. They've used it all through school. They're well uh, used to getting the best out of it. They know it, they trust it, everything. So it's made, that's kind of, uh, it's changing the mining landscape. They're, they're almost like the most ideal adopters of technology because they're hungry for it, they need it to do a better job to optimize, etc. And the people entering the workforce now are well placed to make the use of it. Yeah, and it's the it, it's that that character and quality of the workforce mm -hmm. is 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 critical. But still, mining happens way up there. Yeah. Right. And and so it's it's we do a lot of work with the forestry sector, for example. Right. Right. And I just talked to a guy who was all excited because now we have the internet of the forest thanks to Elon Musk and you know Starlink. Yeah. We can connect to our machinery and our our mills in remote areas that we never could have done before. And so you talk about that short period of time in terms of adoption and kind of expectation around yeah. technology. Um, I would, would imagine you're getting to a point where your solutions, and I, that phrase I imagine gets overused in your world, but <laughs> because everybody's got one, um, that's what's going to drive the and accelerate, I think, the productivity and the capacity issues. Yeah. So. Where do you see, I mean, it's great to say, you know, we've got a younger, uh, up-and-coming, um, you know, versatile, nimble demographic that's going to move into some of those jobs. Where's the capacity? Do you see a capacity issue here? Are we going to have a problem filling those jobs? It's great to say well, they're there. So, it's interesting that you bring that up. When my experience talking to uh, the mine managers, plant managers, etc., around the plate, they're, they're having a lot of trouble with retaining good people because you can skyrocket now. If you're good, you're in high demand. Right. Um, if you have really transferable skills, you're fast to adapt that kind of thing. That's great. So you know, and maybe it's also the way we teach people now. We teach them to everyone. Everyone's taught going into school that you're going to spend only a few years in your job and then you're going to go. Right. Yeah, I yeah. don't know how it was. I wasn't taught that growing up and I'm just in my 30s and I don't know how it was for you, but I just feel like that's a big change. It used to be, well, I'm looking for the life career and now that's changed. So because of that, they're having a lot of trouble holding on to good talent because there's someone else trying to poach that talent. So they have really high turnover, which has always been a problem in mining. Um, but with like what you're saying with all these uh, this capacity issue is like how are we going to find how are we going to keep on building from the bottom how are we going to keep mm -hmm. filling those bottom positions and then on the flip side of that you have uh, a retiring workforce that has they might might not all be crazy about technology but a ton of them have the thing that the new guys don't 
experience. Sure. And experience is not something you can so put valuable. in an app. You cannot. Right? You cannot <laughs> encapsulate that yeah. and inject it into your young. You need time, maybe exposure to working with those people. But those people are on their way out. These guys are on their way in. The guys coming in have lots of education, but no experience. And that's I'm not saying that's a bad thing against them, but it, they're in a very different place. You know, we don't do internships and and. and uh, uh, apprenticeships and stuff as much as we did in the older days of mining. So there's a lot of very green people in there. So they have the technology, but they might not be the best fit, or they don't know that they don't actually want to be a miner until they start their first day on the job. Right. Yeah. yeah and and, so. and that's an important part of it. But you know, not to get too far off on a tangent, but I'm uh, I'm I'm listening to the book. Um, the guy's name is, um, he, he was the guy who ran mission control for Apollo 13. Oh, yes. Okay. okay. And we all know what happened with Apollo 13. Houston, we got a problem. And he describes standing up the space center in, in Florida in the early days. And he described it exactly the way you've described where we are with mining. And that is to say, everybody who came out of university got a job launching rockets into space with people sitting on top of them yeah. <laughs> and bringing them back safely. Yeah. So when I heard that, I thought, okay, there's, it, there's, there has to be something to all of this enthusiasm and young energy and, and um, you know, the, the, the university experience, there's something to be said for it. Let's not dismiss it. Of course. So too often in that conversation, to your point, and I think you were getting at, it's too easy to say it's got to be either or. You got to have a pretty good balance and blend mm -hmm. to actually come up with the secret sauce that makes well, sure. Well, that's a, it's a secret sauce. No one has a perfect recipe. For right, it, so. and that, and that in, in that case, that where you're particularly into an air of, you know, uh, big heavy machinery coming together with an industry now driven by software yep. and and that kind of higher tech. We call well, and, it. and now the business, the companies are looking to optimize it, not that companies weren't always looking to optimize but now they're really that's what's really um setting people apart we can make more faster right we can make more faster and better than you can that that's i mean that's always sure that's always been the the prime point of competition but i think it's it's the mine is the mines are taking these top-down approaches to massive optimization projects. We're going to bring in the technology, we're going to bring in the training, we're going to make sure we have the best tools, etc. These kind of big swinging changes that I think are really, really certainly good for a technology company like Whipware because we can harness that and say, great, you want to, well, we have all the tools you need, we can train your people here, etc., etc. So that's really, really great. Um, I think it was more so the individual before who was like, gosh, there's got to be a better way for me to do this. And they were begging their uppers for a little bit of funding to try some new technology out or try some new solution. And I think that's that's another big thing that's changed. It's, it's, it's Now it's, it's like a team run towards, we can do this better. How? Let's find out how. Let's do some research. Right. Let's, you know. And that's where the innovation is, right? Yeah. I mean, that's where it happens. It happens in that openness to think of things in mm -hmm. new ways. Maybe it's an old problem with a brand new solution we've been sitting in front of all yeah. of, all these years. So let's get into what you guys do because sure. one of the things and you talk about the, the, the new tech solutions. And if I if I read this correctly, you could actually help when they're blasting to determine the size exactly. of of the, 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 the rock that ends up being, you know, yeah. coming out of that stone exactly. that exactly. large piece of so <clears throat> I got a lot of questions about it. Why would anybody care? Let's start there. <laughs> sure. Well, hopefully I won't make anyone upset by saying this, but at the end of the day, mining is about making big, big rocks into small rocks. And every step of mining, and I'm sorry, mining engineers, I'm not trying to, <laughs> I'm not trying to simplify your job, but if I had to Do it for it, me. I'm the excuse. Exactly. This is fine. If yeah. I had to explain it to a four or five year old, I would say, well, mining is just making big rocks into small rocks. And if you want to do a really good job at that, you got to know what size they are every step along the way. And that's what we do. Now, we do a little bit more than just size. We also do the shape of the rocks. So again, I come back to my question. Why does that matter Why does in that the process? Matter? Right. right, okay, so, no, you're right. So, let's say I blast. I blast two things too big, they don't fit in the truck that needs to move them. I blast them too small, the wind blows them away because they're dust now. Yeah. So I got to get the sweet spot in between, so it's going to be easy to move and load, put into the truck, bring to the next spot. The next spot, it gets dumped out of the truck, and this is not, isn't always universal, but it gets dumped out of the truck and into a crusher. If the crusher can only take things up to a certain size. If they're too big, everything grounds to a halt, 
someone's got to get in there into a dangerous situation where there's a lot of pressure, a lot of factors that could go wrong and break that rock manually so that everything can start up again. And every mine I've ever been to, Corey, doesn't matter the size of the operation, there's a sign somewhere in the office that says, one minute of downtime equals this much lost money. Yeah. So stopping is not an option, or unless someone, unless there's a danger factor, sure. that's yeah, the yeah, only yeah. time you stop. So that's a big thing. We don't want any reason to grind things to a halt. We don't want anything, we want to keep grinding things. <laughs> we want to keep crushing, blasting, crushing, grinding down to our final product. And so in order to make sure there's no bottlenecks anywhere, in order to, you need to know what the size is. Traditionally, we take this stuff, we run it through a mesh screen, and we say, oh, all of it fits through the screen, everything that doesn't fit through the screen is too big, great. So everything's on spec, we're, we're good to go. But screens break, uh, rocks sometimes are really long in one way and short in the other, so they fit through the screen, but they're actually a little too big. There's all these kinds of things that we used to do that were the best option we had. And then Whipware came in about 30 odd years ago with a digital solution to measure those rocks with photography instead of physically sieving those rocks or moving them or bringing them to labs, etc. We can get a big representational sample using photography to analyze, which I know seems crazy, right? So when, they, when you talk about that stage of the, and <clears throat> take me back to the photography application, yeah. Is that after the fact to learn from what's happened or mm -hmm. is that in is that predictive? It's a combination of both. So everything you do, you're gonna take a you're gonna take an analysis of the blast afterwards. You're gonna see and mm -hmm. you know what you know how you laid your shots down. You know how you what what hill, holes you drilled, excuse me, what uh, what powder you put in, how much, uh, how far apart the holes were, etc. You know your entire drill and blast plan. So you know what went into the recipe. But there's many factors in blasting, and I'm just on the blasting side now, that you can't plan or predict. You know, the rock isn't the same all the way through. Right. You yeah, know, there's yeah. changes that uh, there might be a, a cave in the middle of it you don't know about, or, and you just accidentally emptied a whole bunch of explosives into a void in the ground. So maybe the blast is going to happen differently than you planned. That's mm -hmm. the bottom line. So you know what you did going in, you blast it, then you analyze it with Whipware technology. Whether you're analyzing it with our software or you're analyzing it with one of our hardware systems, you're finding out what happened when you broke it. Now you feed that information back in and you go, so what should I have done to get the blast I was looking for? And that's the continuous improvement cycle. That's sure. all this is. Yeah. Plan, act, check, do. Over and over and over And then over that again. database gives you a history of how and where and why and exactly. how. Exactly. Yeah. And then we can plot it geographically. Yeah. We can build a picture of fragmentation in the mine and go, so now let's say it's your second day on the job and you're looking at the data out of this, uh, this system and you're saying, hey, you know, I'm looking at the last six months of blasting and over here on this side of the mine we're getting really bad fragmentation no matter what we do and over here on this side of the mine we're getting really great stuff so maybe we should push our efforts over to this side of the mine where we're getting good material good fragmentation we, we, and, and we'll go back to the drawing board it's your second day and you're making a valuable decision sure. about where to put your resources exactly yeah and then and, and Productivity. We're back to our capacity question. Exactly. And how best so now we're using the new guy is, yep. might might be the savior, you know, or you know, or the someone who just wanted to pay a little bit more attention and do some research. Oh wow. Well, I'm now you mentioned that you know, whipware comes along. You know, it's a thirty-year overnight success, and <laughs> <laughs> here we go. At what was this the original? Yes. Purpose behind whipware. Yes. Was. So okay, so I'll give you a really brief. I say yeah, brief, yeah. but you tell me when I go too long. Um, so in the 1960s, so that's more than 30 years ago, but it starts there. In the 1960s, DuPont pays a million dollars for a computer program for blast modeling. Mm -hmm. So it's the 60s, it's a million dollars, it's a lot of money, and it's a computer program. So like, no one had ever spent that much money on a We're computer We're sending program the guys before. to the moon. Got yeah, it. it's, yeah, it's yeah. like this yeah. just happened. So here we are, they developed this, or this uh, Dr. John Favreau, I hope I'm getting that right, he develops this blast model, they buy it, and then they have to prove that it actually works. And there's no way to do that except for to manually measure blasts, full-scale production blasts. And the founder of the company, Tom Palangio, and his uh, 
colleagues, Dr. John Meritz and Dr. Sorry, Dr. Norbert Meritz and Dr. John Franklin. There we are. Got all of the names right. They were all working together on this solution. How can we? Poor guys had to sieve rock by hand for a while, and they realized there's got to be a better way to do this. This is insane. This is not the solution. They needed to prove the model, though. So they went out and they talked to the University of Waterloo. Okay, I hope I haven't lost anyone yet. No, nope, still with you. At the University of Waterloo, they were working on satellite imagery enhancement. They were for military stuff. Uh, this was the 70s. Cold War was in, still in swing. You know, they were doing all sorts of cool stuff for farming and agriculture, but also for military. And they said, this. Uh, Dr. Norbert Meritz, Dr. John Franklin, they were there at the university and they said, we can take that technology and apply it to pictures of broken rock, whether it's blasted rock, crushed rock, stockpile rock, final product, whatever, and we can probably do fragmentation analysis th with that. What do you think? Sure, let's try it. So DuPont funded that little experiment with the University of Waterloo, and that's where we get our really weird name, because what they came up with was the Waterloo Image Enhancement Process, W-I-E-P. <laughs> we dropped the E, and now there we have go. whipware. Whipware. Right so on. that's why, and just a word of advice to anyone, I love my company, but if you're ever going to start a company, don't pick W. We're always at the bottom of the A to Z directory. <laughs> But so that was the thing. And no one had ever done this before. Yeah. No one ever had a, made a solution for this. And DuPont was a big, big player in the explosives world. Later on, DuPont gets out of explosives in the 90s and Whipware becomes its own company. And Orca and Dino Noble and all these big blasting companies are actually kind of born out of the ashes of DuPont. Like there's a big story there that's for another podcast sometime. But there's a lot of companies here in the uh, Northern Ontario Mining Showcase that owe their roots actually to DuPont's exit from mm -hmm. explosives. Interesting. Um, because they were doing a lot of ahead of their game experiments on the side with technology and stuff like that. Um, so but here it's a, brings it, us back around. But and that's it's where around that whole from. idea yeah. of mapping and modeling that has yep. become, you know, again, that's sort of that Duriger conversation to have in so, in so many areas of natural resources, never mind mining. Yeah. Right. Um, so I, I just think that that's a, we're seeing all of that kind of come together around the technology. Yep. It doesn't matter where you are and what it's like. So at what point, let's go back to your idea, I don't know what's behind that rock, all right? right? There may be a cave there. So at what point is there other technology that comes in to inform you of say, you know, I don't know if it's ultrasound or whatever the technology yep. might be to say, in fact, Andrew, there is a hole there that you might want to be aware of yeah, before so, you actually and, and do your blast. And to be fair, there definitely, there would have been geological surveys done. They might have actually known about that void beforehand, that kind of thing, but they might not know how it's going to affect the fragmentation, right. you know? And sometimes they might not find out it's there until they drill into it. But the point is from here, absolutely, there are different tools. There's a ton of tools out there for blast modeling and drill planning yeah. so they can actually upload the data from our software back into their drill planning software and say, how can I have gotten better? And, you know, every, lots of different people make really great blast models. We have a very rudimentary one built into our software because we like to let the blasters take let care of that. Let them take care of yeah, that exactly. lane. Yeah, exactly. But we give them the starting point of like, okay, so if I would have increased my burden or if I would have increased my spacing or if I would have spread out my timings a little bit or anything like that, then I would have gotten what I was looking for instead of this. So what's more valuable? Is it your the software application or is it the data that you're sitting on? Because the uh, 30 years of that history, it really is, is probably going to inform a whole lot in so terms of what you look at. Interesting you say that because the 30 years of data that we have was used to help us build our kind of one of our big latest developments was we what we do requires us to find the rocks in the picture, right? And, and trace the edges of them so we know where they are but mm -hmm. this all has to happen in you know very fast yeah, yeah. <laughs> blink of an eye uh, so to speak in real time uh, data so um, with the edge detection we had to build a library a deep learning library to do this faster we really wanted to do this and we said well hey we have 30 years of pictures of rocks that we can use to inform this library that we're building and if mm -hmm. anyone that's listening and watching has experience with deep learning you need a lot of these things called ground truths. You basically need a lot of raw data and then a lot of people to give the human point of view on that raw data. Yeah. And then the computer swallows all that and tries to understand it. So we had a lot of stuff to build on going in, which was great. And then we have a giant user base because of how long we've been around that kept feeding us with more new pictures with their consent, of course, and it was great. So we were able to build a new deep learning edge detection model. There's a mouthful for you. 
based on all of this valuable data that you have. But to answer your question more directly, data is like the most valuable thing, you'd think. But actually being able to interpret the data and do something with it is the more yeah. valuable thing. So that is a big challenge that everyone has. I think there's a lot of people in this room that are creating a lot of data. So we're back to our where we started the conversation. Our conundrum, it's, it's, exactly. It's, it's the new thinking and the new technology, the new experience, the new uh, education yeah. comes together with that experienced eye that you need to actually do pull something it all together. With the data. And right? you know, we'll do our very best to show you that data in different ways to help you understand it and really wrap your mind around it and see patterns. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, so there needs to be a champion that does something like that. And that can make it a difficult thing to, you gotta, you gotta get the technology into the right person's hands if it's yep. really gonna you know, elevate and, and someone's gonna do more with it. It's ever been thus. If it didn't know how to use the hammer, it doesn't, it's no good to me. So yeah, you're I don't probably know how to use the software. Yourself. Exactly. <laughs> Andrew, it's a fascinating story. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much, Dave. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for listening to the Northern Ontario Mining Showcase podcast. The series is produced for the Echo Community Podcast Network by Story Studio Network and Clark Communications. For more information, visit our website, northbayecho.ca.